Did you see that? Let's look at it again. Well, if you want to know what's going on here, yes. we need to go back in time, one hour. So come on into chemistry class. Right, so today, all the reactions in the universe fit into one of five types. And we're going to learn about those five types today. So the third type is a little trickier. It's called a single displacement reaction. It's also more common. So a single displacement reaction uses a single element, but it reacts it with a compound. So you have a single element A, and it's reacting with compound BC. And what happens is element A comes in, and kicks element B out of the compound and takes its place. What is one of these products going to be then? AC. AC, okay, good. And what? B. That's right, because you can't just get rid of B. It just gets kicked out by itself. You still have to write it there. <coughs> now, we're going to do the example magnesium metal plus hydrochloric acid. So we're going to use magnesium plus hydrochloric acid. We're going to do that single displacement reaction. But before we can do that, do you remember from last chapter? What do you have to do with hydrochloric acid? You have to rename it, right? Well, how do you do that? What do they start with? Hydrogen. Okay, so put an X over this. This is going to be hydrogen something. Is this hydrogen chlorate or chloride? Chloride. Oh, that's right. Hydrogen chloride. Now, it's important that you rename that acid because the magnesium is going to come in and kick the hydrogen out. But if you didn't rename it, <coughs> then you might make the mistake and say magnesium is going to kick hydrochloric out. You're going to have magnesium acid. That's not one of the products. It only works if you rename the acid. So what will one of the products be? Magnesium chloride. All right, so magnesium chloride. But what's the other one? Hydrogen. Hydrogen, that's right. And again, it's okay if you don't write the formulas as fast as I do, as long as you know how to write the formulas and crisscross the charges. Magnesium is Mg. Hydrogen chloride, that's H and Cl. H is plus one, Cl is minus one. What do you do there? It cancels out. It cancels out, so it's just HCl for that formula. Now, magnesium chloride, magnesium is plus two. Chlorine is still minus one. What happens there? It crisscrosses, right? So what's MgCl2. That's right, MgCl2. Okay, and then the last product is going to be what? H2. Well, why is it H2? It just says hydrogen. It's one of those seven diatomics. That's right, but now we got problems. Look at this. There's one Cl on the left, but there's two on the right. Is that right? Put a two over So put a two over here. Alright, does that fix it or does it need more balancing? It yeah, it does. That takes care of it. Alright, now we're actually going to do this experiment a couple of times and look at it in a couple of different ways. If you'll meet me over at table four, we'll do that experiment now. For single displacement, what we have are three test tubes of hydrochloric acid. We're going to run all three of these experiments at the same time. This is magnesium metal. We've got a piece for each. This will be the basic reaction here. We'll put the magnesium metal into the acid. It's going to bubble. Do you remember what the bubbles will be made of? Hydrogen, hydrogen gas. That's right. Now, because the hydrogen is leaving the test tube, when we do it on this balance, we ought to see these numbers become negative, and they ought to lose mass. Now, are we really losing mass? Where's it going? Out. Yeah, out. Into the atmosphere, right? But it also generates heat. And over here, right now, we have a temperature probe in the hydrochloric acid. It's 21.4 degrees. We'll drop the magnesium in, and we'll monitor that temperature. And I think we'll do all three of these at the same time. Here we go. This is experiment one, two, and three. You can see the hydrogen gas coming out. I don't know if you all can see the balance very well or not, but it has definitely turned negative. It's negative 0.028 grams and still dropping, so we are losing mass. 
this temperature has gone up to 42 degrees and still climbing. Are we destroying matter here? Why is this getting hot then? What's it turning into? Well, we're turning into hydrogen gas, but where's the energy coming from? Do you, do you remember the law of conservations? Which one says you can turn matter into energy? Which LOC is that? Is it mass energy? It is mass energy. That's right. And we're turning matter into energy here. We're all the way up to almost 68 degrees. This has dropped down to negative 0.126 grams. So we're losing hydrogen there. This one has quit reacting altogether. It's, it's used up all the magnesium. Mr. Mitchell's class is great because he manages to challenge me and teach me new things. Mr. Mitchell makes it interesting to me. Mr. Mitchell knows how to make every student feel special. He cares about us personally as well as academically. If we need help, he's always there to help us. He challenges us because no one gets left behind. Because Mr. Mitchell genuinely cares about <laughs> each of his students. The next type that we do is the most common of all. It's called double displacement. It's also the trickiest of all. Type number four, and the name of it gives it away. Single displacement was one element replacing another. What's double displacement going to be? Yeah. You got it. That's exactly right. So now we have compound AB, and it's reacting with compound CD. This is the only one that's a compound plus a compound. Let's label this arrow. What do you think? It makes sense following the system we've been using, DD. So in this example, A comes over, kicks C out, but now C has a place to go. It comes over and takes A's place. What is one of these products supposed to be? AC. A -C. No, not AC. AD. A A and CB. A and C are both positives. Remember the positive elements get written first? So A and C can trade places, but they can't bond together. Opposite charges attract. What do similar charges do? They wouldn't bond together. Now, one more question. Does it matter what order you write the product? I mean, could you write CB first and then AD? Yeah. That's like saying 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 1 is 3. Now, these are harder because they have a lot more formulas. So you got to think about charges and crisscrossing charges, all that stuff from last chapter. The one we're going to do is potassium iodide plus lead nitrate. And this lead has a, a weird looking little Roman numeral 2 act. What does the 2 mean? The charge. the charge of lead or the charge of nitrate? Lead. Oh, yeah, that's right. Good, you remember that. Alright, so let's label this DD. The potassium comes over, kicks the lead out. Lead has a place to go. It's not going to be potassium iodide anymore. Lead. It will be lead. It will be the charge of that lead. It will be. The charge won't change. So this becomes lead, Roman numeral 2, iodide. And it won't be lead nitrate anymore either. Potassium nitrate, that's right. Now once again, you don't have to be able to write the formulas as fast as me, as long as you can figure out how to do it. Potassium iodide is simply Ki. Lead nitrate is PB, with that lead being the plus 2, remember? Yeah. And nitrate off of your charge is NO3. You put that in parentheses. It has a negative 1 charge. Well, we got a plus 2 and a minus 1. That's right. You've got to crisscross it inside or outside the parentheses? Outside. outside. That's right. So it comes down here PB, NO3, parentheses, 2. Would it make it different if you put it inside of the parentheses? It would. It would make it wrong. It would make it very different. Now the products on, on the other side, we have lead, which is still a plus two, and we have iodide, which is a minus one. What do you do with that? So it becomes PBI2, that's right. And again, this is the skill from last chapter. Potassium nitrate is KNO3. Oh, man, we got problems again. We got one eye on the left and two eyes on the right. How do you fix it? Put a two on that. So you put a two here, but wait a minute, that fixed the eyes, but doesn't that fix the case? Yes. Okay, so you put a two here, that fixes the case, but didn't it mess up the NO3s? No, it's not here for that. Right, we had two of those.
All right, now we're going to set up for a double displacement reaction. This is one of my favorite ones. We have two clear and colorless liquids here, and they produce a very surprising result. It's so surprising that I'm not going to do this experiment. I'm going to have an assistant do it. The chemical that I'm putting in now is potassium iodide. This chemical is lead nitrate. Austin's going to add that. One drop only, please. Look at that. Two clear and colorless liquids combining to make new products, just like we saw on the screen. One of them is yellow. Lead iodide is a yellow solid. Mr. Mitchell goes the extra mile to give me the individual help that I need. I like this class because Mr. Mitchell is a model teacher for the school. I like this class because Mr. Mitchell is very interactive with us. Because we can be ourselves. And he comes to us individually and helps us with whatever we need. Mr. Mitchell actually cares. I really like chemistry because it's, it takes a really hands-on approach to learning. The last type is everybody's favorite. Type number five is combustion. What does that mean? Burn. Yeah, burn. Explosion. Explosion. Yeah. What folks like. To do this, it's not an A, B, C, D experiment. To do combustion, you have to have some kind of a fuel, and it can be almost any carbon-containing fuel. Gasoline, diesel fuel, jet fuel, propane, butane, any carbon-containing fuel, but it's not just gonna burst into flames. What do you have to react it with? Oxygen. oxygen, that's right. So you have a fuel plus oxygen, it makes the same products every time. And it doesn't matter what the reactants are, it doesn't matter what the fuel is, you're always going to make carbon dioxide and water. And that's a little confusing. Yes, ma'am? Why does it always make carbon dioxide? Because the, it has to be a carbon containing fuel, right? So that somewhere in this fuel, there'll be a carbon atom. Right? That carbon is going to combine with the oxygen in the air. Carbon plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide. But here's my question. Why doesn't it make pollution? Shouldn't it? Yes, sir. Because we exhale carbon dioxide? We do exhale carbon dioxide, but when you drive a car, you don't get just carbon dioxide and water out of the tailpipe. You, get, you, get, you, do, you do get CO2, you do get water to get pollution, too. How come? Doesn't have enough oxygen. Doesn't have enough oxygen. If you give this reaction as much oxygen as it wants, then you get clean products, CO2 and water. But if you reduce the oxygen, then you get the pollution, the, the tailpipe gases that come out of the back of, of cars, for example. Now we're going to do this, and, and we're going to do it two times. We're going to do flaming fireballs of science. That fuel will be propane, C3H8. We're going to react it with oxygen, which we've already heard from Dylan's O2. Carbon dioxide is CO2. What's the formula for water? H2O. H2O, that's right. Now we're going to do this experiment in this classroom because it's not going to produce any pollution. It's going to have all the oxygen it needs because it's got the whole room for it to use. But there's a problem here. We have three C's on the left and only one on the right. What do you do? You had a three where? Yes, over here. Put a three over here. But now we have four, eight H's. And only two over here. How do you fix that? Yeah, you put a four here, right? So that makes four times two. That's eight H's. But now we got oxygen problems. What is three times two right here? Six. That's six. six. What's four times one? Four. four. So there's ten on the right. How in the world do you make this ten out of five? five? You put a five there. And after we do flaming fireballs, we're going to do a second experiment. We're going to do it three times. And the first time, we're going to do it with 100% fuel and no oxygen. And then we're going to do it 50% fuel, 50% oxygen, and finally 10% fuel, 90% oxygen. And we're going to look at the different levels of pollution that are created. The fuel that we'll be using for that experiment, we're going to create, it's called ethane gas. It's C2H2. We're going to react it with oxygen, O2. What's it going to make? CO2. How'd you know that? Because it always makes CO2. H2O. Now this one is a lot tougher to balance. Where do we start? The two in front of the CO. Two in front of where now? The CO. CO2. Here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now what? A two at the very front. Well, if we put a two here, that's four C's. So, so you have to make the four there. And make that and I erase the C. I can fix that. All right. Does that do it? Yeah. No, that doesn't do it. Doesn't do it. Uh, how many H's are here? 
So what, a two there? Well, what about the O's? Yeah, we had to put a five here. And we're going to do this three times again. We're going to limit its oxygen and see what a difference it makes. So if you meet me over at table six, we'll have flaming fireballs. All right, this is a combustion reaction. We're going to generate the ethyne gas using these little rocks that you see here that I just dropped. Those are calcium carbide rocks. And when they contact water, they give off bubbles. And those bubbles are C2H2, the gas that, that we balance the equation with. I'm going to collect it with water displacement. We we'll do this three times. The first time we're going to get a test tube completely full of fuel. I'm going to light it on fire and see what happens. Filling up the test tube with the gas, forcing the water out. This time we're going to do a test tube completely full of fuel. We're catching it by water displacement. As the bubbles go into the test tube, it's forcing the water out. We'll have a test tube full of fuel. We will then ignite that test tube and see what happens. When I lift it up, you'll be able to tell the test tube is completely full of fuel. There's no water left. 100% fuel. Now, this is 100% fuel. What do you think will happen? Will it burn? Probably. Yeah. Yes. I mean, what do you have to have to have fire? Oxygen. There's no oxygen in here. So it shouldn't burn. Let's see what happens. This is 100% fuel, 0% oxygen. <laughs> do you see it burning? Yeah. Right at the top of the test tube. Why is it just burning right there? Because that's, the oxygen that's where the oxygen is. And actually, if I run a little bit of water in here, it might flare up. Oh my gosh. Why, did it, why did it flare up? Because water has oxygen. That's well, no, well, the ethylene gas was forced out. It, it mixed oxygen down in with the gas and caused it to burn. All right, let's do it one more time now. This time, instead of 100% fuel, let's do 50% fuel. Are you okay? See the water run out? Oxygen took its place. Now I do need to shake it up. How come? Just mix it. Right. So now we have 50% fuel, 50% oxygen. Should we have combustion? Okay, yes. yeah. Well, let's find out. Trial two, combustion, 50% fuel, 50% <laughs> oxygen. Here we go. So we did have combustion. You see all that pollution? It yeah. Why do we have pollution? There is, a, there is a little bit of water in there because it's producing some water and some carbon dioxide, but we didn't have enough oxygen. So there we have pollution. You can actually see it in the air here. 10% fuel, 90% oxygen, we hope. Here we go. 10% fuel, 90% oxygen. 10% fuel, 90% oxygen. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. <laughs> That's total combustion. Heck yeah. <laughs> and it worked, and you can even see the water that we produced inside. We just made carbon dioxide and water. Why is there no pollution this time? Yes. All, All the oxygen. Plenty of oxygen. We'll be using propane as our fuel, flaming fireballs of science. All right, so this is a meter stick with a candle on the end, or a West Virginia flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make bubbles right here. You hold that down low. And what's going to be in this bubble? Propane. Once propane. you, once if you propane's pop. Propane's in the bubble. Where's the oxygen coming from? Where do you think? The room. The room. Room. That's right. So she has to pop the bubble to have fire. Ready? One, two, three. Has the meter stick ever caught on fire? Oh yeah, the meter stick is caught on fire. <laughs> now, when, yes, when the meter stick burns, do you have pollution and smoke and all that stuff? Yes. Yeah, sure, because you don't have yeah, you don't have enough oxygen to make it burn. Yes. One. Two. Shake my nerves and you rattle my brain. Too much love. Now you can't see it as well, but I'm making the same kind of bubble we made before. What I feel, I say, goodness gracious, great falls of fire. I like the love because I thought it was funny. Folks, as this, as this bubble forms, tell me, why, are, why don't we have any pollution? That's right, we have all the oxygen that the fire wants. So we're just producing what and what? Carbon dioxide and water. I can't see the water. Where is it? Yeah, it's evaporating. It's water vapor. You're so fine. You're so kind. Gotta tell the world that you're mine, mine, mine.
science because you can tell Mr. Mitchell loves chemistry. And that he really wants us to learn and understand chemistry. Because Mr. Mitchell actually like really cares about his students. Because I learned more than just chemistry. I learned history and politics and how to apply all this into my everyday life. Mr. Mitchell will always go the extra mile to make sure it makes sense. You're always involved with everything that you do. It's always interesting and you never know what's going to come the next day. Mr. Mitchell cares about his students and he's always willing to do anything to help. Because he makes chemistry relatable to life. Because the teacher makes me feel like a person and not just a grade in the book. My most memorable moment in this class was when I got to explain fireballs with Mr. Mitchell. Told me how to think but not what to think. I found it fascinating. Because we actually learn the stuff like we don't forget it. And he tries to use personal stories to connect his lessons. Everybody in it is like a family. So it turns out it's tricky to take what we think is a special class and make it show up on the field. And I couldn't have done it without the help and support of my students. The yearbook staff gave us cameras to use and I produced the film on the same computer that you saw me teaching with earlier. A special thanks goes to Elizabeth Combs who played all the music for this show. Anything he more? makes me feel like a smarty. <laughs> Smarty. I don't always talk, but when I do, it's usually in this class. <laughs> I love explosions. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Mitchell.